okay? And then uh, about uh, relationship with people, another point very important, don't insist on our ideas. Now, sometimes we think we are right, or maybe we are really right, but they have their ideas. Our idea might be the best idea, but he has his idea. Again, as I said, you want him to go to your idea, he might not go to your idea. So if we insist on, you have to do this, he might not agree. So what we might do, help them to go one step up. Like for husband and wife, very often the wife say, this the way, the only way to handle the family. Or the husband said, this is the only way. But if, if the, both the husbands and the wife says, you have to come to my point, then it won't work. So we have to come to a middle point somewhere. So, and then we also realize that we can be wrong too. We're not God. We can be wrong too. So we can say we don't insist on our idea. And Proverbs 12, 15, it says that the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But you say, I'm not a fool. Yes, right, you are not fools. But we always have a foolish spot. <laughs> We're not fools. But we all have a foolish spot. David has his foolish spot. Solomon has his foolish spot. Okay, and then not controlling. The Bible in 1 Peter 5.3 not lording over those who are entrusted to you because we guide them, we shepherd them, we lead them, we help them, but we don't control them because control them, controlling people make people go away, run away. They feel, sometimes they follow, but then after a while they will rebel. And when we win the heart, that is the best. And then submissive, unity and cooperative. We all need to be submissive. We all submit to God. The leader needs to submit to God. And lead, the leader also needs to submit to the, the move of the Holy Spirit among the people. All the people feel moved by God to a certain direction. The pastor should also submit to that too. And the people should submit to the pastor and submit to the leadership, uh, to, the, to the direction of the church. So that's something we need to find a balance. A pastor who listens to the people will have people submit to him much easier. A pastor who is authoritarian, find it harder to have people submit to him. It's, it sometimes could be by force. I mean, the force might not be squeezing the neck, but it could be just saying, you don't do this, you cannot serve God. But then that's not the Bible's way. Um, now, for unity, how can we hold that? How can we have unity? Because that's your question. Um, first, there should be teaching. Unity is very important. Without unity, the group cannot function. The group cannot grow. And people will be hurt. So we all treasure unity. So, we all know we should all have unity. The problem is, when we disagree, what happens? So for each problem against unity, how can we handle? When there is disagreement, what happens? When you, uh, disagreement actually comes from the wisdom of God. Why? Because God made each person different. No two persons can completely agree on everything. If God makes everyone the same, you know, when you say, go this way, everyone says, go this way, <laughs> then Everyone is like a robot, but God created every single person different. That's why in the church, you have all kinds of ideas, but God has the best idea. But God will lead the people. Sometimes it's the idea of the majority of people that God will lead. Sometimes the idea of the majority uh, minority. Sometimes even one person's idea is God's idea. But whatever it is, so unity is when we all say, yes, we pray to God, this is God's guidance, even though my idea is A, his idea is B, his other idea is C, I will still follow the C's idea, even though I have an A idea. So that's a concept people need to learn, to say, okay, God's moving is that we go that direction, we all submit to that direction. Another problem, you know, 
unity, the problem against unity. First is different ideas. So my answer, the biblical idea is that we don't control, but we you know, let the Holy Spirit guide us. We follow the Bible, we follow God's guidance uh, instead of one man's idea. And then sometimes it's people's problem. Now people's problem we talked about earlier, that we want to handle that with love. I've seen churches split up. When someone has sinned, but the pastor handled it in a very harsh way. And then this person will tell people about how the pastor treated him. And then half of the church followed him and went away. I've seen that happen. The pastor could have done it in a very gentle way and say, well, uh, something happened like this. How can we handle it? And what is the problem? What are the needs? How can we resolve this problem? He could have handled that like that. And this person might respond in a very strong way. He responded in a very strong way. And then still the pastor, if he's, you know, want to be great, then he need to be humble. Then he will say, tell me, tell me about it. What are hindering you uh, from following this direction? What are your problems? And then if the pastor cannot resolve it, it's good to find a group, not just himself. The leadership group all come together and listen to the man. He has this idea. Listen to him. And we pray to God, what is the best solution? So instead of handling, the pastor handling himself and also handling in a personal way, let the whole group handle it. Then the responsibility would not be on the pastor. And the attack would not be on the pastor. And then if anything went wrong, then if the person talked to the whole group, then the whole leadership group would say, this is what happened. Instead of against the pastor. I've seen two churches split up because the pastor handled something harshly. I did not know everything in detail, but I just heard part of it. But I don't want to condemn. I don't want to say anything. I just heard it. I just remember it as a lesson. And I, don't, I still have good relationship with these people. I don't have to condemn them. I don't have to ask them why, what happened. I don't have to ask them. I still relate to them because it's not my responsibility. God has not entrusted them to me. And they have not asked me for help. I don't have to. I can pray for them. I don't have to counsel them. So I know when is my responsibility, when is not. And, but I realize that handling it harshly because some churches they insist submission in a way like this. Okay? This person doesn't submit. You have to leave. Sometimes, if, sometimes not just submission, it's about feelings. Because they can say, the pastor talked to me like that, therefore I don't submit. <laughs> Instead of just a matter of submission, it's sometimes not just a matter of submission, it's a matter of listening. And really finding out what the person's feeling. Now, I thank God for my wife. He's, she's really a good listener. Sometimes when I talk with someone, she can find out where... She, I, I ask her afterwards. She can tell me, okay, these are the things she has said. I notice I have missed some of the points she said. She's such, such a good listener. I really like her. <laughs> and I realize that I can miss. I realize that I can make mistakes even though I'm used by God in many ways, that I don't have the strength in every area. So I can be submissive and listen and find a good way to handle it. And so, uh, um, so here I'm talking about unity, that whatever hinders, we want to really pray about it and handle it in a gentle way, in a loving way, so that it won't break up the church. It has, I mean, those are two churches that I know. But there are many churches that I don't know that breaks up. That's it's a fact because of people, very often because of people's problem. So now what if someone you know in the church are causing dissension? People, they are splitting up people. Now there are sins that are more serious. There are sins that are less serious. Adultery is serious. People chasing after women, serious. Uh, people breaking up the church is serious. 
But how we handle is very important. So we, when we realize that someone's behavior is breaking up the church, when you realize that you have to pray together and discuss together how to handle this person and, and love this person and care about this person to find out the feelings, sometimes people's feeling can be resolved when we listen to them. But still the person needs to be healed. Sometimes people are causing problems in the church because they need healing and no one come to them for healing. Now, for me, healing is not just spiritual healing. There is also healing of the soul. There is healing of the spirit and the soul. Now, what does this mean? Healing of the spirit is when we pray for people and then the Holy Spirit will heal them. Healing of the soul means counseling. Sometimes people think we pray for them. Wow, the evil spirit come out and the anger comes out and then it's resolved. But when he goes home, he has anger again. The problem comes back. So it's not just praying and then the anger goes away. Anger don't go, all go away. The way of handling people don't all go away when we pray. They need to be taught. They need to be counseled. We need to find out what is the problem relating to people. And how can you change? What is the, what is the difficulty hindering them to change? So we need to find out. And then we need to guide them to learn uh, to change uh, in order for these people to change the personality. Now some people, uh, they are so serious we need to have someone to follow up on them continuously so that the personality problem is handled. Now if this person refuses and he still continues to cause problems, then the church has to handle it. And then sometimes something like that happens, someone is you know, really causing problems, gossiping a lot that hurts the church and doesn't listen to any kind of help. The church has to handle it sometimes in a very strong way. The church, the person might have to be, you know, uh, now for me, now the, the interpretation of uh, discipline, uh, of uh, excommunication, some people interpret to mean you cannot start in the church anymore. Some people could say it means that they cannot take communion. They are not past, uh, the, the member of the church anymore, but uh, they can listen to the message and then so they can be changed. So there are different ways of handling it. But if someone, every time he comes to church, he will always gossip, he will always tell someone a negative words about the pastor or other leaders or about the church members, this person, I think, you can either handle it separately, but if he continue to do that, we have to stop him coming to church. If he continue to do that. So as leaders too, when you notice some people are gossiping, first we need to stop gossiping, gossiping ourselves. Because we know that it can be very damaging. If a leader, one of you, or even the pastor, or the pastor's wife, they have some problem. Gossiping is not the solution. We need to talk with them and communicate and find solutions. And uh, if people start to gossip, if the leaders start to gossip, this church will be broken up. It will not grow big. It will have its problems coming back again and again. So that's something we need to be aware. So that's why I said when we build on the foundation, we have to be very careful that we don't give the devil a foothold anywhere. It's very easy to give the devil a foothold somewhere. So uh, if you think of other issues that cause, uh, you know, uh, that breaks down unity, you can ask me later, but I'll just go through this very quickly. And then handle interpersonal problem. I, I just talked about that uh, already, that how to handle when people have problem first individually, and then sometimes people need healing. <clears throat> healing is not just spiritual, but also of the soul, of his lifestyle also, his lifestyle. And then morality of leaders, that we don't gossip, we don't compare. And we accept people's sin, sinful nature. Now I have, this is one problem I find with some people who have the ability to serve God. But when they come, when they face some difficult people, they have problems. They, 
they would have anger, they would they cannot accept them, they are unhappy. And when we have this problem, it's very hard for us to serve. The fact is, all people are sinners. When we look long enough, you will find the sins. <laughs> Every single person. I'm no exception. You look long enough, you'll find my problems. But we, our job is not to look for faults in people. So some people cannot accept people's shortcomings and they really have problems serving because then when they come to this person, they feel unhappy. You can see that. The facial expression, they're unhappy. They, they're not willing to talk about this person. And, and also it's easy for them to gossip also. And another, another is respect each person. No matter how weak, how sinful the person is, the person is still a person we should honor. You know, unless if the person doesn't repent and continue to sin and break up the church, then we have to handle it in a severe way. Even then, when you see him the outside of the church, you still greet him. Don't turn your head away. Now, some people told me they have to leave the church, but then when people of the church see him on the street, they will turn away. That really give a very bad testimony. They said this church has no love, bad attitude. It doesn't change people's life. And also, in a moral, morality is not do not be single, do not be alone with a opposite sex person of opposite sex. Do not be alone. And then marriage and family is very important. Now, but marriage is very difficult because why do we need counseling in marriage? The two persons, why is it so hard for the two persons to have good relationship? Because there is a long history of hurt feelings. It's very hard to handle. <coughs> a long history of misbehavior, of bad language that hurt each other. And that's why when we do marriage counseling, we have to listen to both sides. And it's very important when we do marriage, marriage counseling, we have to listen to both sides with impartiality. I have counseled many couples. Usually it's the woman who comes to me first. Because usually a woman will ask for help. Oh, problem with my husband. Oh, he did this, he did that. And I'll listen. And that's true too. And then, and then I say, can, can you bring your husband here? And some of them can bring the husband. And then listen to the husband. There's another story. Oh, the wife is naked. Oh, he's so <laughs> negative. He's so emotional and all this. It's also true. Both sides are true. What did I do? I did not condemn each one of them. I will listen. I know it's difficult. It's difficult. Yes, I know it's difficult. And then I was guide them to find out the problem and how to handle it. And afterwards, the man said to me, Oh, Pastor, I'm so happy you talked to us because you're the first person to listen to me. When I talk to other people, no one listens to me. Everyone say I'm wrong. <laughs> so it's very important that we listen to both sides and and accept that, yes, people can have problems. It's okay. It's okay. It's not the end of the world uh, that we can accept both sides and listen to them and there are ways to find solutions. Basically, counseling is like that. That we don't have to condemn each person and there is always a solution and usually things that cause marriage problems usually are not the deadliest thing. Usually it's not a third person. Usually, it's just daily life <laughs> that can be handled in a very gentle way. But then, because they're not happy, so they say, wash the dishes, why didn't you wash the dishes? That would break up the marriage. And, and sometimes, you know, I counsel a couple and then tell them, please, uh, uh, you know, how to communicate the words, you know, the words of grace and the words of the law, how to be gentle. And then, after the counseling session, and then the wife walked by, and then the, and then the husband, I don't know what the husband did. And then the wife said, why did you look at me like that? <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, well, when you said that, what do you think the husband would feel? And then whatever the husband, the way he looked, whatever it is, what would, it what would it uh, do to the marriage, the relationship? So it's very often that they didn't pay attention to small things like that. And it hurt the marriage. But I realized too, it's difficult. I said, it's difficult. No problem, no problem. Keep working on it. Every day improve, 
Zero one percent, one thousand days, you're okay. One percent, one hundred days, you're okay. <laughs> I always look at it in the positive side. Okay, and then the last will be attitude toward ministry. That first is God sending us. It's God's calling. It's wonderful calling. It's the highest calling. It's the when we follow that, God is very happy. And when we follow God, God is really happy. And God has confirmed me many ways. First by His presence of the Holy Spirit, and also by God telling people to follow me. I'm very, I thank God, God, thank you, thank you, thank you, because you, you see when people love you, you really see that. And, and I thank God, say, it's not, it's not my goodness, it's God's goodness that, and you appreciate everyone. So I, I'm very happy to respond to God, God's calling. So each one of you are called by God. So see that as something honorable, and we are to please God, and not to please people, even though at the same time we want to please people too, but we don't want to please people just to please people, and have the zeal to serve God. And how can we have motivation? Motivation has to come from God is loving, God is good, God can bless people, and God treasure our, our ministry. So I have, I always have motivation. And some pastor said to me, I look at you, you're always a motivation. Where does that come from? I said, God is so good and I can serve Him. It's wonderful and He rewards me now and forever. So I have the motivation to serve Him all the time. So I, I don't get burned up when I continue to live in the love of God. But if I stay in the law, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I did not do so well, I'll burn up. So we don't need... Now, the law, we need the law, but we need the love for us to obey the law. But the law is not the motivation. Any statement of law, you use that as motivation, it can be detrimental. If you say, you compare, or I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I didn't do it well enough, then it can be very damaging. And also, another point is, have faith. It is God's ministry, not our ministry. God is more responsible for this church than we are. He has a plan. He has a plan to revive each church. When we follow God, the church will be revived. So the faith that is God's work, He will take care of it, help, and there is always a way. And one of my teachings is called looking at everything from God's perspective. Everything including difficulties. When people face difficulty, they say, wow, it's too difficult, no way out. But for God, He always see a way out. When you walk through the desert, is it difficult? Very difficult. When you fly through a desert, is it difficult? Is it difficult to fly through a desert? No. When you go with God, God has a way to solve the problem. You just fly through. No problem. When you see the problem, God must have a way. Then you, you can relax and trust in God. So that's that how to handle problem. Knowing God must have a way. And also, most difficulties, when you have the wisdom of God, you can handle it. When I told you earlier how to handle people's problems, because I noticed that people have lies. The lies are, being loud, you win. Being angry, you win. Anger will win. Or being rough, you win. These are all lies, but people believe those lies. And then also, be prepared to give an, an account of one day. We all have to give an account. Everything we do is visible to God. Now we look up, it's just a ceiling. But one day when we all come to God, I don't know how judgment is, but it should be everything we do will be exposed to God and to the whole world. Even now. Even now. You can think of in the judgment day. Right now it's like you're going back to this day or to the, just every day you come to church or at your home, but then you find that the ceiling is open, and you find the whole world watching you. Every day of our life is being watched by God. If you have, we have this concept, then we'll be very careful. Everything I do will be visible to the whole world, and now God sees everything. So I'm careful what I do, because I know my life is totally visible to God. And then wrong motivation to serve God. For money, 
to get praise. Now, some people want to get praise. When people praise them, they have motivation, and then when they do something, they want people to notice it, or to uh, control people and have power and have motivation that's wrong, or to, to steal the honor of God, steal the glory of God, or compare. Some people like to compare and say, I want to be greater. I want to have more people. I want to have more people in this church than other churches. Or jealousy. Okay, now, so this is what I've gone through. And then, uh, I have also another portion, very briefly, about who is leading the church. Now, there are two ways of, leader, uh, of leadership in the church. One way, very common in many churches, is a group of deacons, and then the deacons will vote to decide the church. But I noticed that in the church, it's not like, uh, in the Bible, it's not like that. When God chose Moses, Aaron, uh, Samuel, uh, Paul, Peter, John, God chose this leader, and then this leader lead the church. Now, but then the point is, some leaders are not really that godly. Then what? I'm just telling you in the Bible, is God chose a leader, and then the leader lead the group. That's what is in the Bible. So the Bible is in the Bible is not led by democracy. It's not led by voting. It's led by godly people. But the problem is, if the person is not totally godly, what happens? Then I think it's always people asking God's direction together with the so that nowadays there are many leaders. It's one leader and then but a group of leaders together asking God's direction to lead the church together. So it could be one person or a group of people asking for God's direction instead of uh, voting. Mm -hmm.